that um, <clears throat> my name is Chris Corrier. I'm uh, So this is a talk for DevOps Days Ghent, which is uh, 29th, I think is what I'm speaking. Uh, it's called Cookies Mapping and Complexity. Um, alternate title, YOLO Lean Agile Serverless Mapping, SRE DevOps Service Pack 4.2, just the basics. Um, last year, I held the first and only map camp outside of the UK in Atlanta, and did it as part of a three track event. Uh, with DevOps Days Atlanta, which I've been organizing for four or five years, and only serverless days that was in Atlanta. That came out of Map Camp last year. I met Paul Johnston um, at Houston Station for 30 minutes and said, I want to throw a triple conference with these three groups that don't really get along with each other, and I want to do the world's largest aquarium. He said, sure, buddy, you go, you go ahead and do that. And uh, sure enough, in April, he was giving the keynote. Uh, I got him to come over. Simon Wardley came and gave a talk, um, and a lot of other people. Uh, so this year, me and Simon seem to be in a bit of, um, of an arms race with conferences. He rented out Sadler's Wells in uh, London. Y'all familiar with the theater? It's a big ballet. Uh, uh, what's the right word? Uh, program. Uh, it's really a bit over the top, but the, the grand tour started at Lean Agile Scotland, uh, went through Map Camp London, and then Lean Agile Brighton, and now I've got about a week of downtime between Ghent. Uh, my spouse is meeting up with me tomorrow, but this is an excellent opportunity to try this talk and get some feedback on it, so thank you for joining us and giving me that chance. Uh, more about me, I'm a socio-technological mathematician at large. My background's in game theory and enumerative combinatorics. Um, I also do a lot of yoga, yoga and meditation for chronic pain stuff, so I have an affinity for Dr. Strange. Um, the whole uh, suffi sufficiently sophisticated technology seems like magic sometimes, uh, and sometimes the mapping and the complexity science uh, you end up uh, with a situational an advantage in situational awareness, which lets you execute a little quicker, um, and it looks sneaky, but it's, maybe it is. I don't know. Maybe. And uh, also, I work for Big Orange Company. They it's a global consultancy, but they have asked to remain anonymous. They said they're more interested with me inside the building than anybody knowing what I'm up to professionally right now. So. Socio-technical mathematician at large, like I escaped from the zoo. Here. <laughs> so today's agenda, um, I'm going to talk about my spouse and our family and this cookie experiment we ran years ago, uh, starting at PuppetConf. Um, that will pull us into cookies and complexity. Who's heard of the Kinevin Sense Making Framework or Dave Snowden? The what's, One. what's what's the name? Kinevin rhymes with Kevin. No. Okay, uh, then I'm going to talk about value stream maps and Wardley maps. Uh, who's heard of Wardley maps? Got a few. <laughs> who's got experience with value stream mapping? I've read the DevOps handbook that goes on about it. Yeah, I worked for John Willis for a while. He lives in That's Atlanta, true. so I'm, I'm actually really good friends with him and most of the people on, in that book. Oh, uh, nice. So I'll, we'll cover those. I, I blend these together a little differently than Simon does. Uh, my, my work is more into complexity science. Um, and Alex, cookies are a good base case example uh, to follow along with to explain this stuff. Um, I'm going to run through a rugged baseline of the Grand Tour, which is a complex model I developed, which has been helping me figure out how to do things like throw international conferences at aquariums and stay out of the country for a month. Um, <laughs> And that's over Lean Agile Scotland, Map Camp London 2019, Lean Agile Brighton. So uh, there's my spouse and our family. Uh, the one in the middle is not mine. That is the one in the front's best friend. Uh, the one in the back is Catherine. The one in the front is Emily. They're my twin daughters. They're 14 now. Uh, there's more to complexity science than Kinevin. So this is the Kinevin Sense-Making Ontological Framework. Uh, this is a decision-making framework by Dave Snowden. Uh, the, the things to note here is on the left we have, well, let's start down here. Obvious standard practices, we sense, categorize, and respond. Typically, checklists work in this level of complexity. So ontologically, we zoom up into a, a more complicated state. 
where they're uh, accepted practices, but maybe not standardized, you're gonna to need to reach out to experts. Here we sense, analyze, and respond, and we typically see maps. Uh, there's a big phase shift over this top uh, part into um, uh, unordered uh, correlative, correlative systems. Um, these resemble quantum physics more than Newtonian physics, so they're not causal. There's a statistical distribution. It is not a binomial distribution. It's something that's going to be fat-tailed, which means medians are more significant than means, and you've got the opportunity for black swan events to occur as dependencies line. Um, when that happens, you can end up in chaos. A shallow dip into chaos will lead to novel practices where we act, sense, and respond. Uh, we use modeling to pull those back into a complex domain where we've got parallel safe-to-fail experiments. And once we've got strong enough correlation, it'll actually come back down into complicated. Uh, Dave Snowden's latest version of the Kinetum framework, he does not even put obvious on there because there's such a strong bias towards can we just put this on a list and do it. But unfortunately, the world is not that simple. Uh, in the middle here, we have disorder. Um, as you move from complex, where we're centered in socio-technical practice, if there's people, if there's agency in a system, uh, it's gonna be correlative, it can be completely causal because people make emotional decisions. And that's data, it's empirical data, not logical data, but we have to account for that in socio-technical system design. If you've got end users, you know what I'm talking about, yes? Uh, so as you, oops, that was here, I'm not plugged in. Oh, power? Uh oh, I went to sleep. Yeah, there we go. So as we come back around, uh, in the obvious, this denotes a cliff, where if you oversimplify without situational awareness, you don't realize how oversimplified you are, you can fall off this cliff into bad chaos. Uh, like, like a truer meaning of chaos, a deep dip into chaos, and you really have to swim back to the short of disorder and try to reorient yourself from there. Uh, this is, Dave does like week-long seminars on Kinevin. Uh, complexity science is an inch wide, mile deep. This is not the only framework that's out there. The Santa Fe Institute uh, has some good stuff. So does uh, Nexi out of Cambridge, Boston, um, MIT area. So uh, if, the, if you've never seen this before, I know that's a lot. Uh, but I am centered in complexity science and the key takeaway here, this list, maps, and models is different. That's my tweak. And, um, and we're going to be zooming into maps today in that complicated space. So uh, per DevOps handbook, you're looking at uh, uh, lean practices, really, is what come into play. Um, so here, we'll run through uh, these complexity domains with cookies. Uh, who's eaten a cookie before? <laughs> Everybody should, right? So that's a shared empathetic experience. You've lived it, you know it. Um, we, we can relate to it. Um, from obvious, uh, who's bought cookies from a store or baked them themselves? Everybody's bought them, who's baked cookies before? Everybody, good, I, I would hope. Um, we jump into a complicated domain, is where you bake cookies and brought them somewhere else to share, uh, like to work or a party. Who's done that? A few less. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. You gotta plan it out. You're baking big, bigger batches and you have to ship them, which changes uh, the level of complexity significantly. And then complex to chaotic, um, shipped hundreds of cookies to strangers in different countries. I'm the only idiot who's done that, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so um, I was putting together a configuration management survey uh, for PuppetConf years ago. Uh, and the kids wanted to set up a lemonade stand, and I really didn't have time to supervise them to do that. Um, if, if you've set up a lemonade stand before, it's you're out in the heat, you don't really make much money, the kids learn I should have stayed inside and played video games instead. So I said, how about you come up with your own cookie company, and I'll put some questions on the survey, and if people answer the cookie questions and leave their address, I'll hire your cookie company to send them some cookies. Um, and they went and made up a logo and put the question, um, my oversimplification was assuming few people would fill out the survey, then Patrick Dubois, who founded DevOps, retweeted the <laughs> survey, and next thing I found out there's like a lot of people all over the world who want cookies from us. Um, so, 
that from this order, I got into the, the complicated space and went and looked at value stream mapping. Y'all said you have not seen this before. So uh, at the top, you've got information flow between uh, a customer, some form of production uh, control, and a supplier. These are going to break out into process steps. Um, where we're going to see material flow, and then there's lead time. So you've got active work, and, and uh, this is how long it's waiting in between process steps. Um, so that's production lead time versus processing time. How much the factory equipment's actually running versus how long we need up for the whole process flow. Uh, what else can I say about this? These three tiers I want to see on a value stream map. And uh, if these silos are, are tightly coupled, um, they're going to, lean practices are going to be more applicable. The looser they're coupled, the more it's going to drift towards complex. Okay? Um, where things are going to start to correlate and the theoretic value for how long they should take, you're going to have a higher variance, is another way to put it. It's not going to fit a standard normal curve um, from a statistical perspective. So a value stream might be something that, say, a particular kind of process engineer might use in, in a manufacturing firm. True. Um, it's, it works for baking cookies. Or for baking cookies. Um, this helps visualize it. If you've made cookies before, this should make sense that we had survey responses, responders. Uh, we got the surveys into cookieops.com, which is the website I set up. Mm -hmm. I sent cookie orders to my kid's company, which is Gemini Snacks. <coughs> Um, they had their batter station, um, which the, the artifact was batches of dough. Um, they had to load the trays at the tray loading station, and they had trays of cookie dough. Once they baked them, they got trays of cookies. Um, they had to cool, and they, you know, there was a quality inspection to make sure they were done. Are they crispy? Are they chewy? Did, they, did you burn them? Uh, and if they uh, sorted into an acceptable batch, uh, they had to cool a little bit longer before we could package them, which you can see on the timing diagram down here. Uh, then they would get packaged, and it would be at least an hour before me or my spouse was going to take them to the post office, sometimes a lot longer than an hour. Uh, we had a higher variance on the shipping part than some of the rest of it. Uh, so anytime you've got end-to-end -end horizontal flow through an organization, you want to have a value stream map to do that. Really, there's going to be one global value stream map that represents an org regardless of its size, uh, but different divisions might have a more particular one that's still well aligned with the global strategy. Yes. Uh, so unless you're in an experimental place, if, you, you, if you're following lean manufacturing practices and you're trying to apply those and you can't get a clean value stream map, you have a bad strategy. It will not fit. If you can't get this map, you shouldn't be using lean. Uh, here is a, a Wardley map. Uh, on the left, we've got Genesis, which is cookie innovation. That is very much towards complexity. Uh, Snowden on the Grand Tour was talking about pre-Genesis, which would be on the other side of that uh, uh, the vertical division on the Kinevin diagram. Uh, baking custom co cookies puts us into custom built. Um, buying cookies, cookie dough, or break and bake would be a product function. And then commodity, we have Uber for cookies, effectively. So uh, commodity is when we've hit utility evolution. This is all based off of S-curves and diffusion in a marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, on a Wardley map, you're typically, you've got, this is showing vertical dependency. It's a dependency chain. Um, so you've got horizontal flow from your value stream map. And then for each silo within your value stream map, you should have a Wardley map showing the dependencies that need to be met for that silo or that workstation to be functional. So one Wardley map per workstation. Um, this one, Catherine <coughs> drew uh, for baking cookies. That's her part of the job. Um, up here, you can see batter is the title of it. She's got cookies and custom built because she's baking cookies. Um, she, I like the, the regional dot she drew to show wet ingredients and dry ingredients. Uh, she put chocolate chips and vanilla and butter at a higher level of visibility than the salt that activates the baking soda. So that has to do with the visibility axis. Um, all of these are in the product space. We just bought all this. We didn't make our own chocolate chips. Um, and down at the bottom, she has a mixer, which she listed as a $200 asset. 
As you can see at the bottom here in product, you have a rental function. So we could have rented a mixer if we needed to, if that makes sense. And then the commodity function driving the whole thing is the electricity that was running. I think our stove <coughs> might be gas, but I would let that slide. Okay. <laughs> uh, my other daughter, Emily, um, is in charge of uh, packaging and illustration, right? She's, uh, we homeschool, she does creative suite. Uh, uh, and does graphic design in Adobe products is what she wants to do for a living. So that was her part of this process. And since the package of cookies is custom built, and it has three custom built components, uh, the cookies come in from the left side of the, the value stream. Uh, there is a custom logo for each season that she would do every time we, we change seasons. And then the label printing. And all these had sub dependencies. So because the, the package of cookies had one, two, three subcomponents that are custom built, um, where really the cookies are the only subcomponent uh, that was not custom built, uh, you know, she could have shifted this around because wet and dry ingredients are custom built, but the components are off a product. Uh, but I'm still getting this as... The, this is the more complex step, is actually getting them cooled off and packaged up and labeled and ready to ship is harder than actually baking the cookies, which is not something I assumed until we put it out on a map. Um, we were given Catherine a lot of credit for baking the cookies and thought the packaging and the labeling was the easy part. We were wrong. Um, but when we mapped it out and talked about it, it made more sense. So a Wordly map is to help drive a conversation about sourcing um, and what your dependency chain looks like and does our strategy make sense, where uh, Kinevin is more of a decision-making tool, uh, and the value stream is, is about that horizontal flow um, end to end process. So there's one of their packages. Um, that one was around Valentine's Day, so it's pink and red and has hearts and stuff. Um, that's a whiteboard where we were keeping metrics on production runs, trying to figure out how many cookies per batch so if they had variance of the number of cookies in a double batch of dough, it meant the cookies weren't the same size. So that was the, the kata that they were really focused on that day, is the muscle memory around the cookie dough ball should be about that big. The baking church, tighten tight, tight the variance. Uh, that was in the spring, um, some nice flowers and rainbow. Uh, I don't know if y'all know John Vincent, he's famous on the internet, but his kids got some cookies and then we dipped into the chaotic. Um, as they got shipped internationally, things got a little bit weirder. Uh, custom convention branding just didn't make as much sense. Chris Bragg is actually an organizer for Ghent, um, and they got them in the mail, and they just looked a little suspicious. It wasn't what they were expecting, so they were tracking vitals on Twitter for a little while as they ate them. Uh, and then Pedro is from Portugal, uh, and... Portuguese Customs <laughs> opened and inspected the cookies uh, before they got dropped off at his house. Um, I really need to put another slide in here to go back here. So the problem was at that point we stopped and looked at what we were doing and decided to quit shipping cookies uh, because it was expensive. And uh, I got into conversations with a couple of companies about sponsorship. But once we started making taking money for it. It went from a reciprocal transaction that you're gonna give us a little bit of info and I'm gonna send you some cookies. Um, it, to pure transactional, here are some money and here are some cookies and that agreement uh, from a promissory perspective is of higher risk and we needed a lot more money and needed a, a more professional setup. So we decided that we'd had enough fun shipping cookies around for surveys and stopped. Which is a good thing to know how to do uh, with any strategy when it's time to call it. Uh, so a little bit about rugged baselines. I, I can't explain the complexity thing with it. Um, from a Kinevin perspective, uh, in that models between complex and chaotic, there is not a, a Wordly map or uh, a value stream map that, that fits it. There's a lot of very context specific models, but less general models. Um, so this is uh, the, the complex model I've developed and been using. It's a blend of empirical and abductive reasoning. So empirical is observation driven. It's not driven by logic. 
abductive logic uh, looks at the inertia in the system but does not make any value judgment. So inductive is a low-level observation that leads to a top-level truth. Um, deductive is a top-level truth that leads to a low-level observation. Abductive is ontologically flatter, where it's more of a topography in the terrain and just which way are things going to roll. Here's the gravity of the situation. Not what we want, but what we think is probably going to happen. Um, that's blend with uh, internal external agency considerations. Uh, who knows a promissory Mark Burgess, uh, which he really just splits things up into promises, impositions, and obligation. So a promise I make, an imposition is something I have foisted upon you, like printing out templates. Um, obligations are uh, an expectation uh, within the mapping community. If I'm in town and someone offers to host a mapping meetup, uh, I have a sense of obligation to come do it. It's fun for me, uh, not a problem, uh, but there's an expectation there. Uh, and then from a lean perspective, we look at throughput and integration. At the bottom of it is environment is the chief constraint with respect to context. So um, the defining local, regional, and global environmental context within this provides a fractal structure. It's like using in out. So going through this, uh, the rugged base line of the Grand Tour, um, I was really thinking I was going to have a main takeaway from either Wardley or Snowden. Um, the Cat Swatel ended up uh, showing up at everything on the Grand Tour and giving a talk, uh, which I was not expecting. Um, so she outmaneuvered all of us. And uh, yeah, gave two keynotes. Um, this was at the, the EDI jam session where some of us just meet up and swap notes on stuff we're working on. Um, there she was talking about a uh, back simulation uh, within a system that they're, they're trying to get uh, machine code ported out to Rust. Um, uh, she was on stage with Ward Lee and Snowden at Map Camp um, and really kept them on their toes, which was good to see, and coined the phrase tools of epistemic, epistemic justice, um, which are for validating your own ability to know something. So Kinevin is uh, a tool of epistemic justice. Orderly mapping is a tool of epistemic justice. I would say value stream mapping is as well. And I'm putting the rugged baselines in the list. It's how I figured out that I needed to give Kat a shout out here because she kind of won the grand tour um, and came up with really clever stuff like that. Uh, her final keynote was on Ashby's Law Requisite Variety at Lena Joel Brighton, uh, where this specific quote came out, I am going to speak at a DevOps conference and this is to a DevOps audience that the focus is shifting from metabolism to maintenance, um, a shift from growth to survival, which reminded me of uh, Max, well, Mac, yeah, Max and Eve, um, that once an organism reaches a certain size, it must direct its efforts towards other forms of maturity. Unbounded growth is like cancer. I, I'm paraphrasing Max and Eve. I couldn't find the quote. I think that's about what he said, and I'm pretty sure it's Max and Eve. Uh, but there's Max and Eve's fundamental human needs. Um, supports her claim. So from a requisite variety perspective, Ashby says variety kills variety. Uh, the variety of the system needs to match the controls that are regulating it, or the controls need to match the system. Uh, so you would, a very complex system, like people in a social structure, uh, these are their fundamental human needs. Um, so there are settings where we want to take actions with things, and there's a qualitative experience to that. Uh, I'm not going to read through the whole list. Um, there's also Helen Grove's social practice theory, which we worked a lot with on the Grand Tour, um, uh, that they're doing skills mapping stuff, Chris McDermott, Mark Berger, Bergauer, that's how you say it. Um, and this is one for riding a bike to work. You've got skills and know-how, um, you know, just how a bike works, uh, materials, you need routes uh, and appropriate clothing, um, changing facilities maybe, and then a meeting. Is this... Uh, social, is it competitive, is this to save the environment, or to save gas money, um, but for a social practice you need these three elements to get people to actually do something. And from a complex domain it's not about writing a manual and your users are doing it wrong, it's if we just meet all the dependencies from the social practice perspective uh, and, and make that the easy thing to do where the inertia in the system is drifting, people are just going to do it. You don't have to tell them, it becomes intuitive. Yes? 
Um, and with that, that's all I've got. Closing note from Cap, and a little bit on some mapping and complexity science. Questions? Yes. <coughs> so when you said that the most difficult part is the shipment, um, well, can you show the map again? Like, why do you think that is because the, the amount of countries or the info you're getting was uh, different every time, or why, like, not a defined process for that, or why? Like, looking at this map, how, how does that tell you compared to the other one that this is? Yeah. Mm. Um, so, the number of subcomponents that are in custom built is really what it is. Uh, the easiest thing for me to do would be to send you a gift card to go pick up free cookies at a store down the street, because I really don't have, I can do that with email. But um, when we move, that would be effectively a commodity function, right? Yeah. If you just filled out the survey and got a code in your email, it's almost like an Uber for cookie delivery. Um, when we get into a product space, uh, usually when you shift left towards Genesis, uh, it's things get more expensive, but you've got more market differentiation and you've got a tighter constraint on quality control. So the cookies we shipped were delicious. They were amazing homemade cookies. Um, part of the problem we ran into from a shipping perspective and a distribution, a supply chain, which is you could do a supply chain map too. Uh, the farther away you were, the longer it took for the cookies to get there and uh, the, they would be stale. Yeah. Um, versus fresh out of the oven. And the reason custom built cookies are so good and that people still make them today is because uh, product cookies have to sit on a shelf for a long time. They have to be distributed frequently. And that's a good question. Uh, what in, these are custom built cookies. What ingredient switches that makes a big difference with s store cookies that are sitting on a shelf? Does anybody know? The eggs? There's usually like powdered egg in it. Mm -hmm. That's not the one that really kills it though. The, things that, the thing that makes cookies delicious... Refined sugar? Butter. butter. It's the butter. Is, yeah, butter. Which is more they the, swap out the butter for palm oil because it's shelf stable uh, and is like has a very long shelf life, mm -hmm. but the cookies always sort of taste terrible. Yeah. <laughs> is the uh, it's a consistent terrible. Yeah. Um, it being on the right side of this, uh, it's... Uh, very tight variant, uh, tight control on the variants. All the cookies are the same, they're equally terrible. It's a very commodity cookie. So that's uh, bordering the commodity function. Mm -hmm. So and that's part of the reason I like, I'm writing a book about this, and part of the reason I like the cookies as an example, it's an empathetic experience, but uh, the level of complexity you can surface in the cookie industry, I, and my kids get it, it's, yeah. it's a pretty safe. Example. So you um, you mentioned that um, <coughs> you were thinking, okay, can we do like the peer-to-peer -peer transactions, and that you decided, okay, this is where we introduce too much risk, and we go into this contract that we have with a um, a person that has expectations of because they paid for it. Did you use the map to make that decision? Um, I used a rugged baseline. Um, I wanted to give a summary of this tour I've been on, because a lot of people in the DevOps community know what I've been up to, and it felt a little insincere to say, I've been out of the country at conferences this month, but talk to me about that later. Um, I needed to give them a takeaway, and I thought it was gonna come from Wardley or Snowden. Uh, so in this same structure, uh, we've got um, throughput and integration. Uh, that is where Right here. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, oh, yeah. And I've got it in a so that's a good catch. Uh, but that throughput integration, part of that is how much am I spending, what's my op operational expense, what's my capital expenditure, and I realized it was 100% operational expense. There's the survey data ostensibly was worth money, but the, the number of cookies we were having to ship per survey and the cost of customer acquisition is what they usually call it, was so high. Uh, I it hit a point where I was going to have to charge somebody so much for advertising at the end of the day that I was, I, this isn't fun, yeah. and it's not making much money, so let's not do this anymore. <laughs> um, and, and one that's in the book that I did not include in this talk, uh, my wife has a, a homeschool theater company. Uh, she didn't really want the theater company, but there was a market demand for it. Her degree is in choral pedagogy, so she's a conductor. 
and she really wanted a choir. And when we got into mapping out her strategy, uh, she realized what makes a homeschool theater company that's singing musicals better is that they're in a choir a couple times a week and learn how to sing and practice that separately. Uh, and she come to the understanding she could charge extra for the choir, but it wasn't going to need any more investment. Uh, and it made it fun for her, so there's less pressure on it to make money. Um, from a Max Neep perspective, which this quote aligns to, the system was, is not focused on end-to-end -end growth, year-over-year -year growth. That is not the strategy of the homeschool theater company. It's maturing in other ways. Uh, so they change studios and the costuming gets better, um, but it's designed to be sustainable. Um, and we pick fun over profit with the homeschool theater. So it's, uh, uh, it just needs to be able to pay its bills. It makes a little bit of money, but not much, but we, it's intentional. We reinvest it in and try to throw more parties for the kids and do it up a little bit more because that's what the motivation is. But it's, if you don't have that understanding, you can run through a lot of guilt thinking I should be making more money when you don't even realize that's not why you're doing it. <laughs> I mean, I think that's like really an important point because you said intentional. So like how often do we do things and we don't know what our actual intention is? Right. And then we're unhappy and then or, or an organization is confused about what it's actually trying to accomplish um, because it's not intentional. Yes. Um, and there is more to this. Uh, there's it, uh, the Western model. Um, these split into a, a pathologic and a bureaucratic state. Mm -hmm. Right now, in each of these diagrams, your internal agency and your external agency is aligned to the individual groups. It's of a group mentality. There's a social focus there. Um, they're not hard-lined through uh, the commitments they've made or what the throughput is. Um, so that flattens it out where it's more bureaucratic and there has to be a bureaucratic gambit to try to bridge that and say, let's not get so legalistic with each other and try to cooperate on more human grounds. And there's a point where it's pathological and one side of this will decouple from the environment and leave because they cannot come to a commensal state where there's any sort of peaceful coexistence. Uh, but that did not happen during the Grand Tour. Some folks did. Not everybody made it to all of these events. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, it's it's important to note that the DevOps Days event, even though that's where I'm speaking, this is forces me to acknowledge that is one conference in one city. It's at a regional scale compared to the rest of the places I've been on this trip. And the most localized I get is this trip to Amsterdam and Brussels, where my spouse is joining me, which is really vacation time. I'm, this is my holiday. <laughs> <laughs> So, this is what you do for fun. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she gets in tomorrow morning. So nice. Uh, time Here is in rich. Amsterdam or Brussels? Uh, Amsterdam. Oh, okay. So that, that was a question I asked her if this was on Tuesday or Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Did she want to come to the meetup? And she said yes, but from a promises, impositions, and obligations perspective, I'm glad we got it scheduled on Monday. <laughs> she's tired of hearing me talk about all this. Would you mind tying, tying this in somewhat to your work in, in, in DevOps as well? Because I think that um, one of the things that we, the challenges that I think probably all of us face is, so we're, you know, engaging with people and, you know, there's things that we like to help and encourage them to think about. And I think one of the things that attracted me to worldly mapping was I realized that, oh wait, I've been in situations in which I could help people understand what they're trying to achieve via mapping. Um, so how, how, how has this helped you in, in that area, the, um, the work that you've been doing? Uh, the, the conference at the aquarium, um, there is an internal agency within DevOps days and within MapCamp because I'm an organizer for both. So that mm -hmm. model had, um, you could dive into the red and it split into mm -hmm. more components, much like the people I've got on the left here. Uh, the external agency, the place I really didn't have any feel in was serverless days. Uh, and talking to Ben Mosier at Matt Camp, he was a co-organizer, we went through a rugged baseline on King Me for a conference at the Aquarium, because it was, the money looked like it was going to line up, and we could, but should we do this, is it a good idea? 
Uh, and uh, given the risk profile, we knew Ant Stanley and Paul Johnston were in the UK. They're the global organizers who started serverless days. Mm -hmm. And one or both of them were going to be at map camp. Uh, so we started reaching out to get a meeting with them while we were in town. Because if we got either one to sign off for it, um, the opinions of the local organizers in Atlanta were suddenly less. Uh, we had a bit of executive clearance, right? Executive oversight yeah. is big from a grassroots transformation, which is mm -hmm. uh, isomorphic to what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so Paul met us. It was a 30-minute meeting in a coffee shop in Houston Station. So very much, I'm going to walk through the door because I've, I've got time to kill before my train. Mm -hmm. And you've got about 15 minutes to say whatever you're going to say. Mm -hmm. And, I, and honestly, it was very much a, you know, sure, buddy, go ahead. I don't think you really thought we were going to do it. But without that meeting, we would have never tried it. Mm -hmm. um, and you could look at the same situation, uh, a game night, uh, a lean coffee, uh, going to the pub for a drink, uh, 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 going bowling as a team. These are all low-trust uh, commensal activities um, that are more on the social than technical side. Uh, and they can help build a sense of identity within a team, which is really important when we look at something like that, mm -hmm. or even social practice theory. And again, my model looks a lot like this, except it's not fractal, and uh, there's it's a it's a blur of variety. There's only three subcategories there instead of five. So depending <coughs> on the level of complexity of the system. I might, I usually use this, I, I codified it because it was useful and I'm sharing it because maybe it's useful to somebody else. Uh, social practice theory is another one I'll use. Rarely do I try to map out all max mute because it's just noisy. It's just a lot. Mm -hmm. just, and that's why I like a rugged baseline is I can stack up one of these in 20 minutes and have a good idea what maps I need to draw and what actions we need to take, and if we should even try to do it in the first place. Yeah. This is, this is, yeah. um, is, there a, is there a book or a resource where these like, ideas are all put together? Or are you bringing out, are you? you know, I'm, I'm in the out? process of writing. You're writing. Oh, that will yeah. we'll share. Yeah. It's eight and a half by 11 full color maps. Um, I map out the aquarium, uh, inclusive collaboration, some of the folks from Lean Agile Scotland. I don't think I have any fixes out here. Yeah. Uh, but they had a campaign to raise awareness around uh, neurodiversity in tech, uh, and we used this to map that out form a strategy. It did not work, and I talk about where we made a mistake. Um, and really what it was in that external agency at a global level, we were looking at diplomats and heads of state to try to raise awareness, celebrities, influencers on Instagram, which makes sense if you're a techie. Uh, the external agency from our group that we really didn't think about was other uh, act activists within the neurodivergence space, and there's a lot of infighting in that space. They're very, there's a lot of split tribes on mm -hmm. what should we, what word should we use to call this thing, and who's right, who's wrong. And you see that in DevOps too. Anytime you draw a domain around a community, you're immediately going to see them split into factions and start arguing. Um, and the more noise there is around that, the lower their, their integration is, effectively. Um, and the harder it's going to be for uh, them to couple with another group. Uh, they're going to need a lot of executive oversight for that. So, yeah, that's supposed to be out by DevOps Days again. I've, I've still got some writing to do. So, <laughs> so I, I'll see. I'm reading. So I'll Which one are you on? Uh, it's one from, uh, it's called... Uh, flow, like I think it's called 12 Seconds of Flow. It's with a partner that I worked with once on, on an engagement. <coughs> yeah, it's, by a bridge. it's by a guy called Finn Golden, who is, is like the ex global CTO of, of Eva, and he's kind of started his own, uh, like, I guess, digital transformation, small consultancy that he's running. Um, and it approaches like transformation from a more uh, 